today is, uh, Steve, a celebration day for sure. This is monumental. When I say this, what am I talking about? This is the Museum of the Bible. It is a 430,000 square feet museum that is dedicated to a book, the Bible. Uh, there is no book like this book. It's impacted our world. It's foundational to our nation. Uh, and we wanted to have a place to celebrate that book. We look at it in three ways, its history, its impact, and its narrative. And it is a thrilling day to see this journey uh, uh, come to an end. It really, I say we're right, running to the starting line because as we open, we are just starting. Yeah, okay, high five. Yeah, amazing. Okay, first of all, spike the football. It is, uh, it is, it is open, okay. Show us a little bit as we kind of take a walk and talk. We are on the sixth floor, which okay. has got the great view of the Capitol, the uh, Washington Monument. Up here we have our banquet facility. Uh, and then there's the theater, a 472 seat theater that uh, the top floor is on the sixth floor that goes also onto the fifth floor. So right. we will start uh, with uh, the Broadway play Amazing Grace that was at the Nylander Theater in uh, New York City. And it will be playing here, telling John Newton's story of a slave ship captain that came to Christ. Beautiful. We have our biblical restaurant serving foods of the Bible, which outside there is a uh, biblical garden where people can enjoy plants, shrubs, and trees of the Bible. Wow. For those that don't know or just tuned in, we're at the Museum of the Bible, and this Museum of the Bible is really uh, multi-level, uh, 430,000 square feet. Let's start making our way down to the fourth floor, the drive through history, and <laughs> which Dave, Dave is great. Yeah. Yeah. We look at the Bible in three ways, history, impact, and narrative, and this is the history floor. And on the history floor, we start with the archeological evidence for the Bible, going into the manuscript evidence, the print age, the digital age. And then we have a section that shows the ongoing effort. We're kind of looking in the future to translate this book into every language of the world. And that space is called the illumination space, where Bible societies are coming together to try to finalize the translation of the Bible into every language of the world. They are targeting the year 2033 to have that job done. So we have a shelf that shows every language, those that have a, a, a Bible and those that don't. And if the visitor is coming back, they will see that bookshelf filling up. And if, if they attain their goal, the year 2033, it'll be a full bookshelf. So this floor looks back and is looking forward about the history of this book. Well, how long have, has this been being built? We start. We acquired the building in 2012, but we really didn't get started until about 2014 in earnest. We did some shovels and wheelbarrows for, for a time until there were tenants in the building that once they moved out, then we got working in earnest, and that was about 2014. Basically, we're here. We're just on the mall. Uh, Museum of the Bible, and basically, Steve, this is a this is a big day for the Green family, and some of the blood, sweat, and tears. Just you, you, you do have a smile on your face, but 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 we want to make sure the people know really what this is and what you went through to get us here. Yeah, you know, anytime you're going to do something with the Bible, you're going to create controversy. Sure. And so there's controversy out there and there's uh, people that uh, say what we're going to be showing here and espousing our faith. But I think that what people will see when they come in here is that we are taking a look, a fair look at this book. This book has impacted our world and we just want to present the facts and let our visitor decide for themselves. And we were looking at different cities, but Washington, D.C. just makes sense. It is the heart of museums in our nation. It has world travelers, world visitors coming to this town. And so this uh, museum here in Washington, D.C. will not only have an impact on visitors here in America, but for visitors all over the world. Beautiful. Okay, this floor, story of the Bible. Well, we are here on our narrative floor where we're just trying to tell the story of the Bible. There are people walking the street that have not read any of it. They don't know anything. So where do you start with a person that doesn't know anything of the Bible story? This floor, the goal is to basically tell the Bible story. There is a walkthrough of the Old Testament. Uh, you go from room to room, about a 45-minute walkthrough. There is a Nazareth that Jesus knew where we want you to feel like you're walking into Nazareth. And then there's a New Testament theater that we have 11 minutes is all we have to tell the New Testament story. I've said that with this museum, even though we're 430,000 square feet, we only scratch the surface of this book story because there is no building that can contain this book story. And that is a prime example. We've got 11 minutes to tell the whole New Testament story. 
Wow. So how many artifacts are we going to be able to see? That will change. There are several thousand that will be here, but as we have temporary exhibits coming and going, uh, it will change. But uh, there's probably two to 3,000 uh, artifacts that will be on display when we open. Like what? Uh, well, from uh, uh, early antiquities, uh, cuneiform, there we have a Gilgamesh tablet to uh, manuscripts, uh, the first uh, printed Bible, the early King James versions of the Bible. So, uh, and uh, it, the Israel Antiquity Authority has a lot of artifacts within their space, and I don't even know exactly what all they've got. I've not uh, checked those all out, but uh, uh, if, if it has to do with the history of the Bible, that's what we want to show. The impact of the Bible floor, uh, part of the story, how do you, how did you start getting your head around this side of the storytelling? Yeah, the, the Bible speaks into every area of life and it has impacted every area of life, and that's what the floor here, the effort is to show. Now, uh, because we're here in America, America is one of the stories to be told. Our founders, and you could argue about what their faith is, but they built our nation built on principles they found in the Bible. Correct. The concept that all men are created equal, that was a biblical concept. So we have a section where we show the Bible's impact on this nation, and there's some good and there's some bad. Our nation's not perfect, never has been, never will be. So we show its impact on America, and then we show its impact around the world whether it be science or uh, economies, art, literature, music, uh, in, in all areas of life, uh, this book has had an impact, down to a section that just talks about individual life stories. Here's an individual life whose life was drastically impacted by the Bible, and that we so, uh, show. So from the most powerful nation on earth down to an individual life and everything in between, this book has had an impact. Was there any particular moment in time, week in time, month in time during this process that you wondered if we'd be here today with a smile on your face. Was there ever that low of a valley in regard to what we're celebrating today? When we first got started, it was just a dream. So in that sense, it was, is it going to become a reality? But as we got started on this journey, we just saw God showing up time and time again. The fact that this building became available, we wow. see it was a part of God's hand in it. So the further we got, the more confidence we had, not that there wasn't challenges, but uh, that this was really God's project. We got to be a part of it. And so uh, it just uh, became more and more of a reality as we went and uh, an exciting journey for our family. What I'm hearing you today, what you're saying is that you feel like the Green family in as much as it was a lot of your family's personal wealth that certainly started this, if not, you know, got this to the goal line, um, you were following God's plan. You know, when I think about what our life is, I could say the same thing. If somebody was interviewing me about Trinity Broadcasting, I would just say, look, we were just following God's plan. And, right. you know, I mean, it wasn't us, it was them. You know. So basically the same thing. Um, but your family had to have a meeting somewhere a number of years ago. What was that meeting like? How did, yeah, that, how did that come this about? This has been an interesting journey because it was really, uh, we started by looking at helping a group that wanted to put a Bible museum in Dallas. And uh, as our collection grew, the family felt the sense of responsibility that we need to make this dream a reality and make sure it, it got launched. Uh, now, my brother has a Christian bookstore and, and through the years had talked about a Bible museum. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we just kind of started on this journey uh, not as intentional as it was until the collection grew. And at that point, we realized that this, it did need to become a reality. And uh, we, we really started uh, a, an awareness campaign three years ago in, in 2014, where we have been all over the country sharing the story of having a Bible museum. And we have had over 50,000 that have uh, come alongside us wow. that have become a part of making this dream a reality. So while it, it, it took us to get it started, uh, we've had a lot of support and a lot of people that are even this, to this day are coming alongside and loving this dream and becoming a part of it. We are here in Washington, D.C. The information is on the screen. And if you want to be part of the legacy of what this is, there's information on the screen. Their website is available. Be a part of this. Uh, let me just say personally, it's amazing. And what, you're, what you have and your family has embarked on and the 50,000 others that helped you along the way is stunning. We are just off the mall right here in Washington, D.C. When this building came available, that was kind of one of the triggers. You felt like that was 
you know, God's way of saying, hey, this is, I'm gonna make a path through the Red Sea. Right. <laughs> and, and this really kind of started it. Uh, when was that? And how, how long ago did you get that sense? This is gonna happen, we need to make this, we, we need to jump into this. Yeah, we, we incorporated in 2010 and we were looking, had no idea when or where we would open. Uh, we were looking in three cities. Our survey showed it would be best t attended here in Washington, D.C. So we started looking in earnest here, um, and it took us about 18 months before this building became available. We looked at several other buildings, and uh, they, we were told that this was going to come on the market. We bought it in 2012, and then the construction really didn't get started into, for, in, for a couple more years until 2014 uh, and opening in 2017. So I'm told that it will open in about half the time of most of the museums uh, here in D.C. So as you look down this amazing giant wide shot of what is considered kind of one of the main areas of the museum, I'm looking up and there is something amazing about what we're seeing here. Uh, where do, where did this come from? Well, this, th this is a digital ceiling that we have, the largest of its kind in the U.S. with the pixel count. And uh, it, one of the challenges that, that my dad gave us is he wanted people, when they come in, they wanted their jaws to drop. And so what we did is we have the huge bronze panels out front, the Gutenberg uh, Genesis Chapter 1. Uh, we have the Bodmer Psalm in the glass at the front. And then you come in and you see this digital ceiling, and we just want people to say, wow. Yeah. Hopefully it will inspire them to say, I got to know more. I've got to know more about this book and come in and spend more time. You know, it's almost like uh, there was throughout the centuries, uh, there was a thought, certainly permeated by the Catholic Church for sure, that if you build an edifice that blows people away, there must be something going on with that group. Yeah, we, we really wanted people to come in and, and say, you know, this is done first class. Yeah. Uh, it needs to be done well. Uh, our survey showed over 80% of the people in America agreed that a Bible museum was a good idea. Well, restaurants are a good idea, but they go out of business all the time. <laughs> so this was a winning idea, but we have to do it well and do it right. And we wanted to do it well, and uh, we think people are going to be pleased when they get here. What do you want people to experience that come through these doors past all this amazingness of, of what they're gonna see. All of this hard work is driving towards a point. What is that point? Yeah, I, I think that of all the museums in this town, we have the best material. We have a book that has changed our world. Yeah. And so our goal is to tell that book story in an incredible way, in an engaging way. Because we want people, when they leave here, to be motivated to engage with this book. That is our goal. We want to inspire all people to engage with the Bible. We know it less than we ever do in this nation, and we just need to know it better. So if, if, if they can be inspired to want to know it better, we will have succeeded. To pick one up that they probably have in their home, exactly. dust it off, get into it, and ultimately, you know, we... We, we were just doing some, some interviews with Dave Barton and he uh, just put this into us that revival, uh, oftentimes we think of an event. Revival is when people get a Bible and start acting out what it says to do. Take it as complete truth and then live their entirety of their life based upon those sets of truths. And so I believe what the Green family is starting is a revival, okay? And I pray for you. Uh, the information is on the screen, how you can become involved. We want you, we encourage you, and come to Washington, D.C., just off the mall. The Capitol building where we started was right over our shoulder. We're ending down kind of near the front door here. Steve Green, thank so you. Proud. Thank, thank you. you. We're thank so you proud of you guys. So thank you. you guys. Love Appreciate you. it. Love you. Love Blessings. You. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. First of all, Dr. Carey, yeah. uh, PhD, lots of letters coming after that. Um, just 
to our viewers, this is a monumental thing. Can you break down really what we're standing in in an easy kind of way that we can understand? Is there a way to describe yeah. this? Yeah, you know, we've, we've shot videos, we've done animations, we've done renderings, we've tried the best we can. And some of the people who have seen them have seen them eight, 10, 20 times, and they walk in the museum and say, oh my goodness, I didn't know this is what it was gonna turn out yeah. to be. So it's really hard to do. But what we tried to do is to take the Bible, which is massive, and you could put it under so many umbrellas, and take three steps at it. The impact of the Bible, the history of the Bible, and the stories that are narrative of the Bible. Where we're standing right now is on the history of the Bible floor. Okay. And uh, the, the museum itself is, uh, I'm from Texas, it's the size of two super Walmarts, so it's about 430,000 square feet, 72 hours of content. So if you wanna walk through, read everything, sit down, look at the videos, it's gonna take you uh, nine, eight hour days to do it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so it's, uh, you, it's gonna be hard to exhaust the museum for your interest level. Okay, the, when, when, you, when you think of the global impact of the Bible, Right. You think of the world-changing dynamic of the Bible. You you were you were at least able to break it into three pieces. Right. Right. So let's take those one at a time. How do we experience right. the narrative? Let's say on right. on the narrative floor. Great question. Um, it's a controversial question, of course. Uh, you've got limited amount of time. What do you show? How do you do it? So we took a, a, an approach that we thought was inviting to all, uh, non-threatening to all, okay. and for people who know absolutely nothing about the Bible, that they would get in and say, wow, I, I learned a lot. At the same time, because of some of the nuances in the script and so forth, if you think you know a lot about the Bible, you'll walk away saying, I just learned something new I didn't know. So that's yeah. hard to do. Yeah. But in that area, we have three areas. Uh, that floor has the, uh, the Jewish text, the Hebrew text, that's a 45 minute walkthrough. Um, you know, people say, well, what does it look like? I'm gonna say it's, it's Disney-esque, okay. using a term like a Xerox machine. Okay. And you walk through starting with Noah, a lot of special effects, and you, have, you walk from room to room, doors open, close, the, your, your narration is being led by Ezra, the scribe, okay. and it takes you from the, the Noah up to Abraham, up to Moses, up to the judges, up to, then up to Ruth and Esther, and then we end with David, and we have all these things in between. Okay. And so that's about 45 minutes, uh, originally scored music for every room in that area, and it's a phenomenal ending that um, starts with the Torah in the first room and ends with the Torah in the last room. Uh, the other areas there is the New Testament theater. <clears throat> I think it's most our, our most creative part of the whole museum. It's, a, it's an animation that we created, real actors, but then put it into animation of the, uh, the death, the, the trial, the death, the resurrection, Jesus' followers, the life of Paul, ends on Patmos with John. Wow. 11 minutes and 28 seconds, the whole thing. So I tell pastors it can be done. You know, you can, you can do you, this. You, can, you, you can, can't tell you can't the gospel. Do it, yeah. <laughs> Incredible story. The animation is phenomenal. 210 wraparound screen. So you don't really see it initially. You're just seeing a you know, regular screen. And then the curtains start unveiling, and all of a sudden you're in the scene with them stoning uh, Stephen, and you're in there with John on Patmos and writing the, the last words that the, 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 the light, the darkness came against the light and could not put it out. And that's how the whole thing ends. So it's really quite an emotional uh, scene. And then the third is uh, a foot in both camps. We built uh, recreated Nazareth village from Nazareth, Israel. And it deals with the influence of the Hellenistic influence, Roman influence. Why, why did Jesus teach the way he taught? And a lot of it had to do with him countering these uh, philosophies that had entered into the, the Jewish world. And, and, and many of his parables were really a, a target. He was targeting some of that teaching. But they were also used, uh, he used uh, agricultural settings. So Nazareth Village, as it is here, we have a synagogue where he announces in Luke 4 who he is, wow. and we have a mikvah to understand ritual cleansing. Of course, he took a whole different 180-degree turn to that terminology on olive press and olive crusher area because uh, agricultural olives were used, a partially built roof so people could understand the lowering of the paralytic, uh, uh, the, a well 
so where the women would have gathered, even though it's a different uh, book in the chapter in the book in the Bible, but it sort of gives people well, oh I, now I understand. Uh, the olive trees in there are taken from images from the Garden of Gethsemane, houses, sheep, the whole thing, noises, and it tells you uh, this was a vibrant place. It wasn't cavemen, and oh now I see why he taught the way to. Oh I get that now. And we try to show that in there with uh, more of a colonial Williamsburg type dress with our docents. And that's going to be a big hit. Okay, history. That's another floor of the museum, 430,000 square feet. Yeah. Uh, one of the floors to the history. Yeah. Uh, very difficult to tell that story on right. one floor, and I'm sure. So, yeah. how did you tackle that? You know, we that was hard. That, this is probably our hardest for to address, you know, what do you put out? Um, we've been incredibly blessed by numerous institutions around the world willing to loan us incredible items. But we chose, um, we chose starting with uh, the earliest of the earliest. We chose with the, the first known writings. Mm -hmm. And we, of course, go back into Egypt in that time period. And then with the help of the Israel Antiquity Authority uh, as a one, uh, they brought us items that date back to the Canaanite period. Wow. And they're on display there. So it's not only the items. Um, this museum is as much about the cultural, political, uh, religious setting of the day. And the items really support the story versus the, the item being the story. It's really reversed. Now we've got great one of a kinds. This is an amazing museum for that. But they, uh, it sounds odd, but they're not necessarily the star of the show. It's the, it's the whole narrative or, that surrounds it with a different approach. And then they weave through that and they weave into the Dead Sea Scroll area. Then they go up into, you know, we start marching through uh, time then. And in sections, we have medieval manuscripts, a whole section, Reformation, a whole section with Wycliffe and Tyndale and some of their handwritten notes in those areas. Uh, we deal with uh, some of the great uh, illustrated manuscripts of, of all time are here. And uh, then we get into the uh, whole King James Bible. What happened to that? What happened when Gutenberg came on the scene? Wow. Yeah. And we go through all of that. We, then we move it throughout those areas, and uh, we end up in a, an area that deals with the Cairo Geniza, uh, deals with the uh, Torah and Tanakh, uh, talk about the Jewish roots of Christianity. And in that area, something's really cool. We have a, one of the, le the leading rabbi in, 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 uh, in the world today teaching a scribal hand. His name is Rabbi Adams from Jerusalem. He's here for one year with us, and he's going to create a kosher Torah that we'll donate to a music, to a synagogue somewhere wow. Why he's here. And he'll answer all those questions. Um, well, Rabbi, what do you do if you make a mistake? Well, how do you know you're copying accurately from one document to the other? Uh, how do we know that uh, you didn't put something in? And so he takes on those questions that are asked by er almost everybody, mm -hmm. on, and especially people who don't have a relationship with the Bible. You know, it's always a validity question. Well, how do I know it's real? And he's going to take some of those questions on black and white. And that area ends in what's called illumination. This is the translation of, of the Bible. And our goal is to have one of every Bible ever translated in every language. Oh, my goodness. So we have about, uh, I must round them off, 2,000 Bibles that have been, about uh, 1,500 partial. Maybe it's New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs. And then we've got a, over almost 2,500 that have nothing. And this room represents all of that. And you get to hear the stories about the translators and Wycliffe and p people giving their life in modern times. You know, we, some of us know the story of uh, Tyndale and sure. some of the, but it's still, still going on even at a higher rate of, uh, of uh, a death uh, that occurs. Wow. So all that goes in that room. And then the impact, that yeah. would be uh, a difficult story to tell. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, just say uh, big is the, the shortest answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the impact floor. Yeah, it's a great one. Uh, question. We took two approaches. Um, we took first of all impact of America uh, with the Bible. Right. How did it get formed? And we got John Bradford's Bible up there, and we've got uh, Julia Howes Ward's poem that she wrote two in the morning at the Willard Hotel that was published and became known as the Battle Hymn of the Republic. We've got, uh, what was the Jewish role in founding? What was the African American role in founding? Many, many documents. Uh, then we also have a fly-through on that floor, a sensation of flying through Washington, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you will then fly through, really a motion of flying, and it's that sensation, and you'll see where 
uh, God's word is inscribed on monuments and buildings, even up with a drone on top of the Washington Monument. And, um, and you'll see that. The other side, maybe it could be our most trafficked area as far as, uh, we said, how do we explain the Bible's impact on the world? Let's go down roads that you never thought about. So we have, is one of our opening uh, areas, the impact of Bible on couture fashion. Oh my goodness. So we have the fashion dresses from a couture fashion show that was held in New York City, and these are well-known designers, and they'll tell you why, what has inspired them from the Bible to for these dresses that are on exhibit and jewelry, wow. the impact on uh, music. So what we've done there is we've got, you know, great religious singers like B.B. King and others like that. And uh, the lines they use, it pops out when they're singing. And here's a line they took straight out of the Bible. The impact on, on uh, art, the impact on, on motion pictures, the impact on uh, literature, the impact on governments, the impact on human rights, the impact on compassion ministries, on churches, on the impact on hospitals, the impact on work, the impact when you put the Bible into the criminal justice justice system, what happens, testimonies by all lifers in prison, live today, and a little jail talk, you got to be a little, you know, we put a little warning, and they tell you this is what changed their life when they got a hold of the Bible. Wow. And so, and, and we have more of those, yeah, in there. Wow. Well, doctor, uh, first of all, just thank you for uh, what you've done. This is a day, hopefully you're celebrating a little bit, yeah. you know. Hopefully you got a little bit of a smile on your face. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of hard work. And uh, what do you want somebody to experience that comes through the Museum of the Bible? It's really one thing. We, we don't have a plan B. Uh, we, we want people to engage in the Bible. And you take it at whatever level you wish. First time you've ever opened it, great. You've opened it 10,000 times. Maybe you walk away with a little bit more here. Mm. And uh, we've, we've done it in a way that hopefully you get excited by it, uh, how it's presented here, engaging, um, almost entertaining, high academic, so over 100 have worked on this museum. And we've combined the two. And um, I just hope people, when they leave here, are saying uh, that was worth going to. Beautiful. And that's really what we're after. Beautiful. You know, I can, I can kind of see down the road, let's say 100 years from now, and the stories of impact on people just coming in here. It's, right, yeah. it's almost like Trinity Broadcasting starting a new network right, that yeah. covers, you know, another whole part of the earth. Right. And the impact of that, you kind of never know, yeah. but you'll hear it through the ages right. of the impact. You know what? When I was a little kid, I took a field trip to the Bible Museum in Washington, <laughs> you know, on those stories. Right. So what a joy to even be here yeah. and be a part of this. And, and yeah. just so thankful for you guys. Well, thank and you. And all the work and the... And the your, your life has, right. has been in this yeah. for the last few years, and we yeah, just thank we, you for that. We poured into it. Yeah, uh, do, do us one uh, favor. Enjoy the moment. Yeah, yeah we all enjoy the moment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what happens is when you open the doors, and it looks gorgeous, you've seen it, and we just hope all the duct tape holds yeah. together <laughs> behind the scene. There you go. Thank you, brother. God You're bless welcome. you, man. Thank great you. job. Yeah, great.